trickle in. You are, this is a very good use of your time. Our school has been, um, our, made our instructional focus on writing for many, many years because it is a critical skill that our kids need to master now um, and be able to apply uh, in the future. Currently, your students who are in second through 11th grade are taking the annual state test. Many of you know that. And as part of those tests, your students are assessed on written conventions and writing strategies. But specifically in the fourth and seventh grade, students are given a, uh, an on-demand writing test that asks them to do a little bit more. We're very fortunate because we have Mrs. Garcia who is um, not just, in my opinion, the best writing teacher in the district, <laughs> but the data shows that she is the best writing teacher in the district. This is the second year in a row our school has had the, the highest writing scores in the entire district. Last year, in fact, um, Mrs. Garcia had 100% of our students who took the CST writing test score proficient or advanced. So we are very fortunate to have the expert in the district present this uh, to you. So um, having said that, I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Garcia. And um, if we could just welcome Mrs. Garcia to her own <laughs> If I know she would have said that, I would have just started with that. <laughs> um, OK, well, welcome. And we're going to be talking about today all sorts of the kinds of writing. So if you have a child that's not in fourth grade, it'll still apply to what you're doing. Um, someone once said, if you can't explain it in writing, you don't truly understand it. The funny thing that's that could have been me. <laughs> somebody said it, and I remember hearing it. I just don't remember if I said it or somebody else said it. So, But it's true. If they can't write it down, they don't truly understand what it is they're telling you. They can... Sure. They can go ahead and explain away something and then sit down and have it in paper and say, okay, write it, and they'll go, I don't know what to do. I don't know how. So something is missing in the understanding. So what I'm going to do with you is you have a packet that's really thick. Don't worry. We won't go word for word through it or you'll be here till tomorrow. Uh, but we're going to go through, and I'm just going to highlight parts of the packet and show you examples of different things that the kids have done or different things that you can do with your students. So, in elementary school, there are many types of writing. Um, there's the, the large actual writing on the paper of narratives, which is a story. So it can be fiction or nonfiction, true or not true information that they are writing down, but it's still in a story format. They can do informational expository writing, where they're giving facts and details. Um, they could be writing summaries where they're given a story already by another author, and they need to summarize that story. They can do a response to literature, which is a combination of the two, writing a small summary and then analyzing the work. As your child gets older, the response to literature section will, will become more and more prevalent. They will no longer be asked, I mean, they might be asked to write a story here and there, but a majority of what they will write as they get older and older will be read someone else's work and respond to it. So it's, it's, and it's not an easy genre for them to grasp, but this is where we start. Then we also have letter writing. So the students need to know how to write letters. We have things like writing correction, sentence forms, persuasive writing. They're asked to write in all. It's no longer just write me a story. There's actually a purpose behind what they're writing. And we, at the end, um, Dr. Lynn asked us to look over the district rubrics of what the district expects each grade level to do, and also at the state test and how does the state, state test test the writing for all the grade levels versus just the fourth grade. The next page in there is just a simple paper uh, for you to see the kinds of writing. It's either a narrative or it's some type of giving of information. It just depends on the two, and that gives you some terms. So, for the student, the key steps for your child. When you see your child come home with homework, or they're in the classroom, what they do, what they want to do, and what they, they should do aren't always the same thing. If I ask a child, okay, let's write a, let's write a story about what you did the other day. They grab the line paper and the pencil, pencil and say, the other day I, and they just start writing. They don't plan. I, and I ask them, when your parents go to the grocery store, do they go shopping first, then come home and make the grocery list? 
because that's what you're doing. <laughs> you need to plan it first and then do the writing, and they tend not to do that. In order to plan, though, they need to have some tools. They need to know text structure, and in fact, further in the packet, there's some examples of text structure. You need to know, okay, I am writing a narrative, and narratives have these parts. I am writing a summary, and summaries have these parts. They can't just sit and write anything. There's an actual guideline that they need to follow. One of the major things for students when they write to lower their score is that they don't follow the prompt. So one of the key things is they have to know what the prompt is asking them to write. If it's, please tell me the story about how you spent one day with a dragon, then it needs to be a story about one day with a dragon, not five days with a lizard or you know, whatever they come up with. That goes back to the planning stage though. If they know the prompt and they plan, they'll stick to the topic. Another guide for students is that they should write from their own experience. They can do so much better if they write from their own experience. Now they may not have spent a day with a dragon. However, they have had a real day in their life. They know what a day is like. They also know what maybe Stimson Park is like or a park nearby. They don't have to pick one in the middle of Australia that they've never been to. I try to encourage the students, especially when they think it's a test of some sort, write from what you know. If you go to Disneyland with your family every single Saturday, take that drive into Disneyland with you because you know Disneyland. But if you haven't been there in five years, don't go there. Try to get them to learn from their experience. They need to add vivid words. They need to choose fresh transitions. Dialogue is very important. You're either going to quote or dialogue. So quotation marks will show up in your writing no matter what. And in this new day and age, I wouldn't have had to say this 20 years ago, they can't use texting in their writing. <laughs> you know, no W with a slash, no BC, no TTFN, none of that LOL shows up in their writing. They actually have to use words. <laughs> and the big thing for students of all ages is to read what they write before they give it to me. Because they, all of us, our brain works faster than our hand. And so we'll get a good idea and we'll start writing it down and then look back and go, oh, forgot a word, spelled out wrong, or whatever. They, just, they don't do that automatically. When they hit the, the bottom of the paper, they're done. They turn it. And they turn it in, yeah. And then I go back and say, what is this? What's missing here? Does that make sense? So have them, and if they could read it out loud, that's even better. The next page on the packet is um, just a simple one for the kids. This is something that they can figure out on their own. Simple things, simple guidelines. Now, steps for the parents. The first step to being a good writer is being able to clearly tell someone else your thoughts. Verbalizing is the key. So even if your child is in kindergarten, you can start them off on the road to success as a writer now. And that is by asking them to think out loud. Do not accept because as an answer. Ask them, you know, what are we doing today? What did you do today? Tell me about it. Get, ask them to give you details. Explain what they did. You know, did you have a nice day at school? Yeah, what did you do? Uh, yeah, they do know they were there. Okay, so then ask them, but don't just let them say we did math, we did spelling, we did. Tell me about it. What did you do? Get them to talk. A lot of times kids talk, but they talk out of sequence. They jump all over the page. So you can ask them, okay, tell me about your morning, but tell me in order. So that's even as a kindergartner, you can start their writing process by getting their thoughts in line. Another thing you can do is, um, to ask, or to give your child a prompt. Let's say you want them to tell you a story, or you want them to write a story. Give them something to write about. Don't, don't sit down and say, here's a paper, write me a story. Because they'll do the same thing to you that they do to us. They'll say, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to write. I learned this lesson when my children were little. We'd give them a journal on vacations and say, OK, write something. Write about today, and they go, Deer in the headlights, I don't know what I'm supposed to write. So I, I learned, okay, let me give you a prompt. My favorite thing I did today was, now tell me about it. 
So give them a prompt, and it can be silly and it can be fun. You can have them practice giving you two reasons. We do this a lot. There's a game out, um, Would You Rather, or something like that, it's called. But you can ask them those questions. Would you rather ski down a slope of mashed potatoes or swim in a bowl of chicken noodle soup? And, and then they can tell you. I would rather ski down the mashed potatoes than swim in the chicken noodle soup, period. Here's my first reason. Make them give you two reasons. Don't just say, because. Because is not an answer. Okay. Um, and then they can write it. After they've learned to practice doing that out loud, have them write it. Give me two reasons in writing. You can have them work at home on a really good sentence. It doesn't have to be a five paragraph essay every time they sit down or they won't want to write. Let them write a recipe, let them write the directions on how to brush their teeth, let them write anything. But just, does, everything doesn't have to be a summary of what they read, everything doesn't have to be a book report. It can be really short. So if you keep it active and you keep it changing, then they'll be more apt to want to read, or to write. When you correct their work, my suggestion would be, think of one thing you want to work on. I want to work on capital letters. So we're going to just look for capital letters. It's hard as a parent to not want to correct every error that they make to make it better. But that will discourage them rather than encourage them. Just pick one thing. Say, you know what? I want you to write for me a crazy adventure of whatever. And I'm going to be looking for every time you indent for a new paragraph. And as long as they know that's the only pressure on them, they'll be more apt to write. If they think you're going to bleed all over the paper, they're not going to do it. And um, the other thing, which is the first thing on here, is read to them. Read out loud to them. Other authors write wonderfully. And if they can start to hear the flow, even as older kids, my, I have a senior in high school and a freshman in high school, and we still have times where I read out loud to them. And then they read out loud to me because there's a flow of words that they need to hear, even to get it to come out of their pencil. It doesn't come out automatically. OK. Any questions before I go into the types of writing? Cool. Okay. So the first type of writing that kids encounter a lot is narrative writing. And if you want to go on to nancyfetzer.com, she will have a narrative chant for you that's up here on this poster. I would do it, but there's teachers in the room, so I'll do it. But basically, what she's, she t we've taught the kids at our school, and I would think from young grades all the way up to fourth and fifth, they can, they can narrate this chant to you. Um, but she goes through and gives you all the parts. Every story has a setting and a character. They need to start out with the setting and a character. That's the beginning of their story. From a little kid to an adult, every story has these things. If they don't have these things, the story isn't very good. We don't buy bestsellers off the shelves in bookstores that don't have these parts. So to start with, they have a setting. They have a character, and if you have an upper grade student, the character, the main character, we call the protagonist. The protagonist drives the action of the story. In, in, in other words, what their actions do lead the story. So when your child is writing, they need to pick who their protagonist is, who their main character is. The main character isn't necessarily the winner, the hero, the villain. It could be anything or it could just be the one who's driving the action of the story. The antagonist, then, is the one who goes against the protagonist. We tend to teach kids it's the good guy and the bad guy, but it's not always the case. The protagonist is the one who leads the story along. His or her actions guide that story. The antagonist goes against that person. Whatever this person wants to happen, the antagonist is going against it. So all of that becomes the beginning of a story. For any grade level, those parts are the beginning of the story. The middle of the story is where the plot is. That's the heavy duty part, especially if you're in the fourth and fifth grade. You have to have a plot. And it starts with a problem. 
every book, every character has a problem. There may be overarching problems and smaller problems, but they, there has to be a problem that can be solved. Once they have a problem, they set a goal. And the goal is obviously to solve the problem. To reach the goal, then, they go through steps, actions, episodes, and events. And all of this together is called the plot. At some point, all of that has to come to a head. That's called the climax. And then you come down to the resolution. And I'm teaching the students that you actually have to have a resolution. You can't just end the story with the end. Please. That's in my paper. I wrote that. Don't write the end. Because for the state test, you actually lose points if they write the end. You can't write the end. Uh, you, and you can't just say, and so they did this and this, and they've happily the ever after. But you have to actually develop the end of the story as well as the beginning. And the problem with kids is, and probably the same for adults, is you start out with grandiose ideas, but then it takes too long. So by the time you're at the end, you go, eh, whatever. <laughs> So, not every story, story has a theme or a moral. I heard a neat, um, Rick Reardon writes, if, if you, your kids read any of these books, he writes the Percy Jackson series. So he had five books out, and now he's coming out with another five or seven books or whatever, and they're really good books. But he one day heard that a professor was giving a lecture on his books in a college, so he went to the lecture. And he sat in to hear what this professor had to say about his books. And she had these glowing reports. And then she got into this big, huge discussion on the theme and the moral of the book, and saying how he planned this all out. This is how it was meant to be, and da 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 And then he, asked, he raised his hand in the lecture and said, how did you learn this information? And she said, well, from studying and all this stuff. And, and, and he goes, why do you? she said, why do you ask? And he said, well, my name is Rick Reardon. I wrote these stories for my children. They have themes, they have morals, but that wasn't the intention. Not every story has a theme or a moral for us to learn from. It's kind of put that teacher in place. <laughs> so if you look on the next page, um, the, um, this is that poster. So if you want to go home, if your kids are real little, they may not know all those parts. If they're older in fourth and fifth grade, they should know all the parts. They should be able to, to say for you all the parts of the narrative uh, text organization. But that's the basic gist of it. If you turn the page, it has a map to organization. You can have maps that are so simple to very complex. For example, three boxes. Three boxes are, are the key to life. You can just do, if they're in kindergarten, you can just do this part a beginning, a middle, and an end. If they're in first grade, second grade, you can start adding, okay? Maybe we need more than three boxes. Maybe we need some transitions in the middle. Maybe you can give me details on the three boxes. But it doesn't have to be this big, huge graphic organizer. It can be just three boxes. This map, the map to organization, shows you with words and pictures. I took, if you have a fourth or fifth grader, or a third grader who's a advanced in writing. I took Nancy Fetzer's chant and turned it into the to the graphic organizer that you see right here. Which is going to fall out. That was good for the video. Uh, and I, I broke it down for the kids. So when they write for me, I hand them the graphic organizer and I say, start here. I give you the plot, or I give you the prompt. Here's the graphic organizer. Don't start writing until I see the graphic organizer is filled out. Because like I said, they will do it the opposite way. So this one breaks it down into all sorts of parts. Physical, what do they look like? Actions, how do they act? Uh, exciting events, surprising events, or twists in the story. And, and then it goes on resolution of humor and moral. The next chart in the packet is person character chart. And we have some of those around the room. Here's a little one there. Um, oh, there it is. There's another one. And you can use these, again, from a very simple route to a very complex route. If you have a young child and you just want to get them to develop their characters and stories, simply ask them these questions. In, say to me, uh, 
Uncle So and So. We have an Uncle Joe in the family here, Kitty, that picks on Uncle Joe, so I'll pick on Uncle Joe. Uh, if I said to my to a young child, Nick, who is that? They'd say Uncle Joe. And then I could say, How old is he? And you and, and ask for your child to repeat it in a in a sentence, not in a word. And then, you know, they'll come up with 95 or something like that. But then you can just ask them, what does he look like? That's appearance. What does he act like? That's personality. What is he good at? That's strengths. What does he need help with? That would be weaknesses. What does he want to do? Those are his goals. A young child can still verbalize those things. And as they grow from kindergarten to first and second, it can become in writing. And then it can be one character where we take just one main character and we pull out all of those details. Then it can be the protagonist and the antagonist and compare. Or we can take two different books and compare the main characters. If they learn to do this from other people's writing, they will be able to develop their own characters in their own writing. They can't go from zero to 60 with nothing in between. They have to have examples along the way. So, the best way to start is using real people in a real world. And then, I mean, it could be the dog, it doesn't have to be a person. And then move it up into, here's two different books. And then move it to, okay, you know what, you've read, you have this experience now, develop two different characters. And when they see it in writing in front of them, they are better able to develop their characters before the story starts because they can make one really good, stellar person and one really evil villain person. That's how they start, because they can see the contrast. And eventually, then, they'll be able, as they grow older and older, to blend characteristics and people. Mrs. Garcia, how can parents adapt this graphic organizer so that they can uh, compare, easily compare characters? I usually just draw a line down the middle. Is that too simple of an explanation? Um, I just write it on the side, draw a line down the middle, and that's two different characters. I mean, you could do it for a whole book of all the characters, just keep drawing lines down the columns that you want. But like I said, you know, start out verbally. I, even in fourth grade, I start out verbally. Tell me about this character. We talk it all through before we write it down. Any questions on narratives? Okay, so nonfiction, there is information and expository. I'm going to uh, speed up a little bit. Um, they start with a hook. This graphic organizer is Nancy Fenton for expository text. It starts with a hook, a setting, a subject, and a big idea, some kind of introductory statement, what we would call a topic sentence, to give me, it still has a setting, somewhere in the world you're doing this, this thing. It still has a subject, their character, but now it's called a subject. There's still a main thing that you're going to talk about. And then you give information, information, information. Gathered information. The best way for students to do the best on this kind of writing is to quote the author. They have to realize, though, that they have to put it in quotation marks and say it's from the author. Otherwise, that's stealing, and that's called plagiarism. We don't want to do that. And then it ends with a conclusion. And a conclusion is restating whatever they said in the top part, in new words. So to write an article, have them read maybe um, a zoo book or the kids' newspaper or something like that. Expository writing is very difficult for kids because they don't understand what they're reading, not because they can't write it. Once they know what it is you're talking about, they can easily figure out, this is what I'm talking about. Here's three details. I'm going to quote the author or give examples, and I can restate what I said at the top. The format is not difficult. The problem comes in that they have, don't have enough exposure to nonfiction information to be able to pull it off. Just like narratives, it doesn't come out of nowhere, that it's gained from experience. So. For nonfiction, you have to do the same thing. They have to read. They have to be exposed to nonfiction. And it's a little bit tricky because it's not around. Are they doing any of that in class right now? Yes. Uh, I can speak for fourth and fifth grade. That's a big push this year in particular. That's a big focus of our school. Um, 
And I know when the standards change in two years, that it'll be even more embedded in our curriculum to have um, exposure to so um, that. Yeah. So, I think, and it's hard because um, sometimes as a parent, we go, well, I'll use the newspaper, but then you go, well, I don't know if I want you to read that. <laughs> you know, because the, the newspaper can get pretty graphic or, or depressing or whatever. So you have to look outside of that. I know we use stories about eccentrics. You can go online and look up kid-friendly stories, nonfiction stories, and there's plenty of them out there. I would re highly recommend reading it before you give it to them and then have them. Or they can look in encyclopedias. For the upper grades especially, but even in the lower grades as we'll look in a few minutes, there is a push for using reference materials. So they can go to a kid-friendly encyclopedia or almanac start looking at the information on something. And their first time that they write an expository piece doesn't have to be, like I said, five massive paragraphs. It could be, you know, I can't think of anybody right now off the top of my head, but Michael Jackson was a superstar musician. Give me three facts. And then repeat what you said at the beginning. Just so that they get the hang of, of writing nonfiction. Summary writing is uh, when they read someone else's work and rewrite it. Now, the key to summaries is that, that I don't know if any of you had your children do the library program in the summer where they read books and they go report it at the library. Has anybody ever done that? Yeah. My children would might as well have gone to the window and reread the book to the person in the window because summarizing was not their best skill when they were little. I mean, they could just ramble every single detail out. A real summary is only one-third to one-quarter of the length of the actual article. So if they read a book, it's got to be short. If it's a one-page article, then it's a one-paragraph summary. It's not write as much as the original author did. They come in different formats, and that's what I was talking about text structure. Whoa. In a couple pages, I'll show you text structure. You have to know what the, how the article is written. If the kids, if it's a narrative that they are, Summarizing, they'll summarize using that format. If it's an article of information, they'll summarize using this format. If it's compare and contrast, then they'll take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and do the same thing. It just depends on what the summary is that they're writing. And as we teach from kindergarten up, we try to expose them to all different types of summary writing. If you look in the pages, it will help you to follow what I'm talking about. But the first page is a narrative summary template. And that one is a great way to start out a summary. The author blank wrote a whatever story it is. For example, the author, uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder, who we're doing this week, wrote a historical fiction story entitled um, By the Shores of Silver Lake that took place in, remember where Silver Lake is. <laughs> and then in the story, the main character, Laura Ingalls Wilder, and then go into a summary. That's a great way to start a summary. Summaries need to start with title, author, genre, and then if it's, if it's nonfiction, big idea. They need to say the title, the author, the genre, and then the big idea. If it's a narrative, then they don't say the big idea. They go into the life of the person. So here are two samples. And again, start with them orally. Just get them to get your student to say this to you. And then eventually they'll, they'll know it and can write it for you. On the second side of that, it's even easier. So if your child is even younger, um, author wrote whatever this book is mostly about they can get the hang of writing these kind of summaries. This is, the next page is, here's an example. The author, obviously, okay, so Mark of Athena came out yesterday, if you know anything about the Percy Jackson series. So I'm trying to start reading it tonight. Um, <laughs> so my mind is on uh, Rick Reardon. But, so here's an example. The author, Rick Reardon, wrote a fantasy story titled The Lightning Thief that took place in New York. The story, in the story, the main character, Percy Jackson, and then I write the summary. Now you're probably wondering, okay, if I start here, how do I get the summary out of them? 
this is the first way to do it is um, one of my favorites. And this is an example of it. I have it here and I have it over there. You can start with three lines. And if you look at this paper, I'll explain how it works. You start out and in, oh, let me tell you this first. Show, don't tell. Don't just say, the other day in class, I had the students do a very quick, as fast as you can, tell me the story of Little Red Riding Hood. And it came out something like, there was a girl who wore red, she took goodies to her grandmother, the wolf got her, he ate her, but the huntsman saved her. <laughs> I, but that was like some of my good writers, okay? At least they had all the parts. Um, and I'm trying to teach them, don't tell me the story, show me the story. So. Um, this, that looks more complicated than the one on the paper, but this is what happens. So this morning, we went back to Little Red Riding Hood for just, and this is just a five minute activity. It's not a big half hour, hour long activity. And I asked them, where was Little Red Riding Hood? And they go, oh, in the woods. I said, okay, add adjectives. Tell me about the woods. So they, in their book, they're scribbling along words that go with woods. I'm not talking about the whole story. I'm talking about the woods. And so they started adding dark, still, scary, haunted. And as they talked to each other, the words get better and better. So we went through that. And then I asked about Little Red Riding Hood. Well, tell me about Little Red Riding Hood. And they came up with the word eccentric because we're learning about some eccentrics. And one of the things is she had a hood on that was for riding, yet she was walking. So why was she wearing that hood? Why did she have that cape on? Was that the style of the time, or did she just really like it? So they decided she was eccentric. And then we put the basic, this line is for the action. So you have setting, character, and then the action. What happened? And you tell, the first thing is the intro. So, um, well, she walked through the woods and they started with saying, taking cookies to grandmother. Oh, she was taking cookies to grandmother. She said, okay, tell me about how was she taking them? And then I said, add the adverbs. That's a verb, add an adverb. So they said, pleasantly taking them. And then somebody said, skipping. And I said, can you skipping taking? That doesn't sound right. So we were editing as we went. And so they, and then I said, add, add your adjectives to your, to your nouns. Make sure every time, use transitions. And they went through. So our first sentence went from, Little Red Riding Hood was a girl who went through the forest to give her, give her grandmother cookies to one chilly fall morning in the still dark, still dark haunted woods. An eccentric yet nice Little Red Riding Hood was skipping pleasantly along, taking mouth-watering chocolate chip cookies to her sick grandmother. I like it. <laughs> but they, they can do they They did this. I didn't do this. But they just fill it in little by little. The more they do this kind of activity, the more naturally it comes to them when they don't have that paper. So, I would strongly encourage doing this. It's fun, even if you're just like on vacation and doing a journal. Say, okay, let's do it this way. Because it introduces the parts. The um, transition words. <clears throat> I don't have a paper in there. I should have stuck one in there. It says transition. But what we do is we put sticky tabs down the sides. And they have to make choices. They can't please, on behalf of every parent, teacher, anyone who works with children in the whole world, don't let them just write when, 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 then, 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 so, so, so. Because then I say, ay, ay, ay. <laughs> I just go, oh, not another then. Okay? So I make them choose. I use sticky tabs and I make them choose. You have six options here. These are your I and G O line words. Surprisingly, suddenly. Okay. Swimmingly, you can add L-Y to almost anything, miserably. Okay. These are your time words. Okay. When is a time word. But they can't use that more than once. Then is a time word. If they use when, I don't let them use then. You've got to pick one. Okay. But then use other words. One day. At least can be phrases. A hot summer afternoon. Yesterday. Whenever. Okay. Location words. Place. Not just where, but any words. Figurative language, similes and metaphors are a little harder, but instead of saying, then they came, you could say, as quick as a cricket, they were in the room. 
So as soon as they start learning their metaphors and symbols, it makes just a better transition. Conjunctions. I've taught the students the easiest, the littlest words in English make the biggest difference in our vocabulary. And. And brings things together. Or makes you choose. Okay? Um, so makes you make a decision. But means that you were here and you're going to make a U-turn. Something isn't going to go right. You just can't throw that word out there. It actually has a meaning. So we use those little tiny conjunction words, but they actually have big impact on what you're saying. Like the word not. Which one is not this? If they don't see the not, they're done for. And then previous or new ideas. That's a hard, the hardest part of the transitions for the kids, but that's like saying, um, as in the days of old when King Arthur roamed the world or whatever, so and so. So it's a harder transition for, um, oh, I know one. What's that Star, Star, Star Wars? Long ago in a galaxy far, far away. Okay. So that's that kind of thing, a previous or a new idea. If you can get them to add these to this chart and start this chart with one of these, they will get four or six, well, they'll get, the, the scores are higher, a three or four if you're ready for from the school or from the state because it's got all the parts it needs. So if you start out with the summary thing and move into this kind of setup, and it doesn't have to have three sentences, it could have a whole bunch of sentences. You could break this into, okay, do your beginning this way, do your middle this way, do your end this way. Then they will write a good summary. Text structures on the next pages. And that I'm not going to read to you, but those are the types of things that summaries could be involved in. Um, cause and effect, compare and contrast, sequence, problem, solution, description, main ideas, points of view, generalizations. All of those things are parts of people's writing, especially nonfiction writing, that they might have to figure out. And then the last... The last one in here that I have is response to literature. Again, that is responding to someone else's writing. In fourth grade, they could be asked a variety of questions. They could be asked, why do you think this is a good title for the story? To start in a response to literature, they need to start with a brief summary. And again, this focus, author so-and-so did such and such, is a great way to start out with a three to four sentence one of these, and that is all the summary you need. One healthy chunk paragraph of summary is all you need. If they summarize too much, their grade will go down, because the point is to summarize quickly, to do a snap summary of it, and analyze it. So once you say, I think this is a good title, or whatever it is, and then I think this is a good title because, okay, that's when you have to start analyzing from the text structure. It, and it's pretty, it's not that hard for students, but they do need to follow a certain pattern. Um, and I'll show you that on the next pages. They could be asked, what do you think would be a good title? Instead of, is this a good title? What would be a good title? They could be asked, what's the theme or the moral? Did, they, did the author develop their characters well? What is the lesson that's to be learned? All sorts of different things. It just depends on whatever the state hands down to us as the prompt. And we practice all of those. If you look on the next page, it has accordion paragraphs and a practice guide for a six-sentence paragraph. This is more for analyzing work or doing a nonfiction piece. First, you give me your topic sentence. I believe elephants are the best pets in the world. Okay, if that's your nonfiction piece, then you have to do reason, detail, something and then an example. Reason, detail, fact, and another example. If you do that three times, and then re-explain what you said in the first sentence, you have got a good paragraph for an accordion paragraph. As your children grow up and hit middle school and high school, they will be asked to do Schaefer paragraphs, which is the same thing. A topic sentence, you 
have to give your reason. Um, my son one wrote one about Edgar Allan Poe last night. So he, he gave the title author genre a big idea. Then he wrote, you know, I think the theme of this story was, I can't even remember, something depressing. Uh, revenge corrupts people, something like that. And then he gave a quote from the story and an explanation of it, and then he went to the next part, and he did it again. Another thing that he thought was part of the, the revenge thing, another quote, another reason, and he did it again. You do that three times, and you, re you conclude with the same thing you started with in new words, and you have a good paragraph. So these um, are kind of just like, helpful ways to get the kids to organize their thoughts. Again, they need to organize before they write it, not after. And if you have a little one, then you can go back to the three boxes. Instead of going this way, go this way. And have them do, okay, here's my topic sentence, here's my introduction, whatever I want to say. I think mom should give me chocolate. And here's my three reasons. And here's my conclusion. And the conclusion is what I said up here. So therefore, I think mom should give me chocolate. <laughs> I just have to fill in. Mom should take me to bookstore or whatever. They're trying to get out of it. On the next pages, I gave you um, just a sample off the internet of prompts if you want to practice writing with your children. There's a list of universal themes, so if they're asked, okay, what's the theme of this story? There's a whole bunch of themes they can pick from. Sample character traits. The next list, signal words, those are a whole bunch of transition words so that we don't have to read then, 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 when, when, when every time. And then it goes to the rubrics. I'm not going to go through every step of every rubric. That would take way too long. Um, but what I did was I put in here the rubrics from kindergarten through fifth grade. This is what the district wants us to wants us to grade your students from this, these papers. So if you get a paper home from one of the teachers and it has a one on it or a half on it or something and you think, that was the best story ever. <laughs> and the teacher may agree. It may have been a great story, but we are held accountable by these papers. So if you look at them, you'll see that there's a lot of things that are similar in every grade level. It builds. We're not bringing new things out of the hat every year. Whatever starts in kindergarten, I'm still looking for it in fifth, fourth grade and fifth grade. It's just, just like math, it builds. You'll notice that it goes two, four, six, and six is meeting grade level standards, and eight is above grade level standards. So when your child comes home with a three, don't panic. That means they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. For them to come home with a four, it means they're doing above what they're supposed to be doing. So if you, if you can peruse that while you're laying by the pool. <laughs> but if you'll notice, by the time you get to fifth grade, <clears throat> the rubrics are much more complicated. But one of the things you'll see is it says, and you know, includes what was in the previous paragraph what was in the previous grade level. So you're always going to be building on whatever you had before. And lastly, Mrs. Garcia, can I just interrupt with certainly how these aren't aren't these rubrics kind of what they expect the students to be able to do? This is sort of an end ending product, right? Because a lot of times parents get overwhelmed right. seeing these rubrics and they're it's very natural for a student to sort of show progression throughout the school year. Right, and they're broken up. If you look at the very bottom, it'll say number one, number two. That just goes by trimester. Not because we expect that they can write a narrative and it's going. They're done by, what this be? Is it now? End of October? <laughs> yeah, like a couple okay. weeks now. <laughs> a little confused. Um, but what it's saying is work your way to this. By the end of your grade level, you should be able to do these things. And the reality is that not every child will be able to do this. But now that you have them, at least you can go back and say, OK, I can kind of see we're here at this grade level. Let's work toward this grade level. And 
work your way up. But, but every child is different and everybody's development is different. Especially if the kids don't spend a lot of time reading. They won't have a very successful start at writing. So what you're saying is it's okay to see a three by our first conference, but we're shooting for an eight by um, start testing time? You know how it works? <laughs> the, the, um, the numbers that you see, the 211, 422, whatever, six and eight, they have to get a score. So you, you take one column, I'm going to give them a two in this column, but I'm going to give them a four in this column, and I'm going to give them a six over here. Then you add the, the six, the four, and the two and you come out with 12, and so their score is a 12. Then I look on another piece of paper, which isn't in here, and I say, okay, that's a one, two, three, or four. So they can only get a four. Yeah. And so a four is stellar, a three is still on grade level passing. Twos and ones, we need some, some communication going on somewhere. For the state, if you have a fourth grader, two adults read the test, Neither knowing who the other one is or even who the test belongs to. And each is given a 1, 2, 3, or 4, 1, 2, 3, or 4. And those grades come together. And so you can score a 6 or an 8. Then. But from the district, you can't score a 6 or an 8. Yeah, I was confused then. Thank you. Unless you're a writing prodigy then. <laughs> so if you have a child who's in kindergarten first or second or third or fourth grade, and they're taking the CSTs at this point. And as Beth mentioned, they will be taking a different test in the near future. Based on writing, how do they get a writing score out of a multiple choice test? Mm -hmm. They do. So you have uh, some samples of one page from second grade, one page from third, one page from fourth, and uh, set from fifth. And Frequently, the student is given a passage. From that passage, they have to answer questions. And we tend to think if you're answering a question from a passage, it must be comprehension. But they're not all comprehension. Some of them are designed for seeing if the child can edit, correct, revise, use the correct technology, or whatever it is to answer the question. This, the passage is just there as a setting for the question. So what I did was, I, I gave you a passage so you can see the difficulty level increase from second grade, which that's a lot of text for second grade for them to have to then pull information out, to the text for fifth grade. And what I did was, I went through the the released items from the state. And if you want to get released items from the state, you can go online to the California Department of Education and go through their million site link website and find the released items. But what I did was I made a list of all the stems, the question stems. Now these won't make sense in and of themselves, but if you give your child a small text to read, a little thing from news, um, the Zoo News or one of those books, then you can ask them which sentence would not be belong in the story. These are all the stems of questions that you'll find in the CSTs. So all the questions that they ask to grade their writing come from something that looks like one of these. But it will be based on a passage. I didn't give you all the passages, but I did give you all the stems. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if you want to ask um, your student and you want to practice it orally, okay, so tell me, um, what resource would I use to find a map? Then they say, you need to tell you an atlas. If I only want a factoid of information, where do I look? So they tell you an almanac. Okay. That's part of how they grade your student on writing conventions by if they know the resources, if they know the correct way to write something, which sentence in all of this doesn't belong? Which sentence should be the topic sentence? Which is a concluding sentence? What do you not put in a conclusion? They will ask those kind of questions. So they're all written out for you. And what I did was, I put, like, when I first started typing the list, I put just what, it, what the question meant to me. Like, for example, at the top of third grade, which of these would be the best way to begin a uh, sentence? And I put transition usage. That's what they're looking for. 
can you use a transition correctly? And that's those little words, or, so, but, when, whatever. But then I thought, oh, I'll go back and do the professional thing. And I wrote in the name that goes along with the standard. So for that one, it's evaluation and revision. That's what the state calls it. So if you're looking and you want to compare to the actual standards, these questions are developed to answer those standards. Do you have any other questions? What is this list? That list is does it start with the word able? Abandonment. Universal themes. Oh, universal themes. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, you know what? The top got chopped off. Um, yes. And a note on themes. If any of you have kids in uh, middle school or high school, technically, these are topics, not themes. Mm -hmm. The theme has to have something with it. I, I was watching a video with my son that he had to watch. Love is a topic, mm -hmm. not a theme. Love stinks is a theme. That's what it was on the video. Okay? So love is a wonderful thing. That's a theme. Love is a topic. So these are actually more like topics. But then add something to it, and you have a theme. Does that make sense? Yeah. Pet. Any other questions? Hey, does the kindergartner actually going to get a score by the end of the uh, school year, or how does that work for them? We'll get one in about three weeks. Every trimester. Every trimester. And how are they? How, how do they? How do you test them as far as for when it we comes to writing? Them up front. What do you like to do on a sunny day? And they need to write a sentence that answers the prompt with a character and a setting and action. On a sunny day, I can swim. Wow. I know. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But it's phonetic yes. spelling, right? Yes. It's phonetic spelling. Can you then do that? <laughs> We're getting, we're teaching this. Wow. <laughs> That's kind of why I was saying, for all parents, it's kind of overwhelming at some points in time when you see their scores and they didn't get a passing on the report card, maybe they didn't get a passing score. It's very important to think that it takes, it really takes a long time to develop a fluent writer. So it's important to remember that writing is constantly, you know, evolving and, um, it's different in the upper grades because they have many genres that we that they have to teach. In the primary, kinder, and first, there's not as many genres, largely because they don't they don't know how to spell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't know how to spell. And they don't know the concept of like a character, a setting, and action. So, you know, just kind of keep that in mind. That it seems overwhelming, but it, it, there's a progression to it. Wow, I'm looking but forward to see the fourth the quarter. Is <laughs> that doesn't mean it can't. Work on it. And it's as amazing. you can see, so if they're writing that in kindergarten, they shouldn't be writing that still in fourth grade. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Not that any of your students have done that. <laughs> um, but, but in reality, if we're all honest with each other, writing is not easy. Even for adults, it's not easy. When you, when you, yeah. Oh, I tell them it's easy all the time. Uh, but, uh, you know, you really have to think about what it is you want to say. And that's why I started at the beginning saying if you can't write it, you may not actually know what it is you're trying to express. Because once you have to write it, then you know it. If you haven't written it, it could still be fly by night. I, I agree with that. I'm a, I'm a grant writer, and my director tells me, oh, write about this program. And then when I get into the questions, and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I know that program. But when I get into the questions of what I need to answer for that foundation, I realize I need a lot more information, and I need to go back, because I didn't really understand what exactly she wanted. So I have to go back and really know. And I, and I won't know what I don't know until I try to start writing. Right, and exactly, as soon as you start writing, you think, I think I forgot something. Where is that? Or, yeah. Even just think about if you're writing an invitation to a birthday party. You know, all of a sudden you have to stop and think, when is it? Where is it? What are we doing? What's the theme? You can't just start writing. You have to think it through. And once you can write it, though, then you know. 
So I think it's it's very clear from Mrs. Garcia's presentation that writing is a very sophisticated, complex process. Um, it's difficult to teach because they're um, because it's so multi-componented. And so our staff has worked very hard to make the writing process as formulaic mm -hmm. as we can. So it's broken down into steps that parents can assist uh, students in following and, and get all of, make sure all of the essential pieces are in a good writing piece. Um, so hopefully, you, I feel like now all of our parents are, are able to teach writing and our teachers are able to be program specialists with all of this. And hopefully she won't go on to be an educational consultant. But um, we do definitely have the expertise here and we're passing it on to you so that you can support our efforts at home. Um, Mrs. Kane and Mrs. Garcia had mentioned that our uh, state assessments will be changing very soon. Um, I think I mentioned at our last workshop that the state has already adopted new um, standards, and that was, those were actually effective in 2010. Um, our kids are expected to be more critical readers and writers. They're expected to defend, to explain, to form coherent arguments, and not just in the, in the uh, uh, area of language arts, in science in social studies, in all of the other, in math, in all the con content areas. So suddenly, your kids' um, uh, success in math is now not only going to be dependent on their content knowledge of math, but on their ability to explain and defend their, their uh, rationale for coming to certain, to their, to their answers. So writing really is a critical piece now, um, and especially in two years when our current first graders start taking those tests. So yes, there's a lot of demand that's being put on the kids, um, and we start them early in kindergarten. You can see that we use the same graphic organizers, just a little simpler um, of a form. Um, I wanted to thank Mrs. Garcia because this presentation really is, I mean, this is a summary. If it took an hour to summarize, you can see how, much, how many hours it takes to really uh, plan a good lesson, and Mrs. Garcia really did take the time to give you the essentials, uh, what she thought that you needed to, to be able to support your kids at home. So I want to thank Mrs. Garcia for her time, her knowledge, and her expertise. And just a very quick reminder to our parents to, if you haven't already, sign in here, because some of your teachers may be offering incentive, incentives for you to be here. And finally, we are uh, recording, so if there's anything you want to see again or, or share with uh, a spouse, um, you can view it online on our, on our website, as well as this packet that will also be available uh, in PDF form. If you so, have a question, I'm here all the time. <laughs> Before school, after school. So she's gonna request. No, no, I don't, because I, I love, I love writing, and I've edited books for, for real publications, and it, it's actually something I like. So, if there's something I can answer, I can this language, um, the language you speak at home, different language, does that have any bearing on their writing? Yes, yes, absolutely. The the larger your vocabulary, the larger your child's vocabulary. Um, they mimic what you say, trust me. They mimic what you say. We hear it all, okay? So, so the, the, the more you speak academically, higher tiered vocabulary, the more they will. And you know, when you think, I know sometimes we think, oh, they won't understand that, but they will because a kindergartner can memorize a list of dinosaurs a mile long. There's no reason they can't find another word for said. But if we use it at home, they will repeat it. But that also goes back to the reading out loud to them. If you would read out loud to them. Vocabulary in books is very rich. See, he's already <laughs> He will be a writer in no time flat. <laughs> Great question. Uh, with my fourth grader, I usually have him go back and plan, use a bubble map to plan his writing. Um, and I know you mentioned it here, and one of the steps is to plan it out. Is it easier for you to use the group, the, the uh, diagram here, depending on what he's doing, or and incorporate his planning in that, or use a bubble map? The bubble maps are good, but they think only of certain things. Like, we, we use thinking maps, and what happens is the kids come and they know a circle map, so that's the one they're going to do. Regardless of the fact that it doesn't help them at all on the writing, they'll still fill in the circle map. So they have to learn, like I said with the text structure, what is it I'm actually trying to accomplish and what map do I need? So bubble maps are good for some things. 
but they won't help you write a narrative. They will help you develop your character or develop your setting or one thing, but it won't get you through the whole thing. So actually, the most simple and easiest one is the one with the boxes, a flow map. You can develop your flow map. You can you can make this extremely complicated or extremely easy. It's usually what yeah, I have to do three support oh. texts for each right. section. So it can be That's beginning, middle, and end. It can be three important facts. It can be, um, you know, you can take this and say, okay, this is my reason number one. Give my example. Give my explanation. Put a transition in the middle. Here's my next one. Do the same thing. You know, all the way to that to her sentence of. One summer day, that's my setting, my character, and my action. It doesn't have to be elaborate. And one of the reasons that, I mean, I use the thinking maps, but I'm cautious because when they go to middle school and high school and college, where hopefully some of this stuff goes with them, they don't use it the same way. I've never seen a college student use a circle map. Then diagrams are used all the time. Flow maps are used. But it just depends, you know, where they go and the key, and you know what, it doesn't even have to look like that. It has to make sense to the student, not the teacher. So we give them tools to help them guide their process, but it has to make sense to them. What is their beginning, what is their middle, what is their end, or their parts, or whatever. So, but yeah, bubble maps are fun, they know how to do them, but it might not help. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>